when we talk about plant closings, other there may be closings in places. In Youngstown, we had a town closing. General Motors buys stuff from Japan. These guys are out of work. Why? That's the question. You just said, why? Well, why? He brought all these boat people in. They're not doing nothing about it. Where are we going to get jobs? They're housing them and everything. Uh, I'll tell you. Tempts a man to go out and steal. The guys change. They, they don't have anything to do. They come down here, back and forth, back and forth. They said they cut the grass or something at home. They don't have nothing to do. This was Steel Town, USA. It's going to be Ghost Town, USA in 1982. Am I right or wrong, Sam? Last winter, the U.S. Steel Corporation shut down this mill in Youngstown, Ohio. They said it wasn't profitable. Today, some of the workers from the Ohio mill are trying to buy the plant and run it themselves. They are particularly bitter because they say they gave up some of their pay and then broke production records on a promise from U.S. Steel to keep the plant running as long as it made money. The workers believe they proved the mill, built at the turn of the century, could pay. When the plant was shut down, pushing the total of jobless steel workers in the valley to 10,000, there was a demonstration. Then the men seized the corporation's Youngstown headquarters, but they couldn't get the decision reversed. Now they are suing U.S. Steel, charging breach of an oral promise and arguing that their production effort made the mill profitable. They lost a trial and are appealing. I feel that the rich man made the law. There's no legal way a working man can walk in a courtroom and fight like they tried to fight U.S. Steel. Well, I don't believe you can really fight U.S. Steel. You're gonna lose. Anytime you jump on somebody big with money, you're gonna lose, legally. You can't do nothing legally. Not legally, I can't see a thing legally you can do. The whole country's in a mess. And the only way that's gonna be changed, there's only one way it can be. In the mill, I have a boss that tells me, hey, go do your job. I better go do my job or I'm fired, all right? You've got politicians, and you've got big business people. You don't tell them what to do. It doesn't make sense. Somebody has to tell somebody what to do. And until the working man, he's the one, I think it's always been said that, that uh, someone better get off their rear end to do something. I'm, I'm afraid it's me. If the working man don't start standing up to the government, to, to the, whole, the whole setup, because we've been stuck on all our lives. That's all I can say. Most of the jobless steel workers get supplemental company benefits along with their unemployment checks, which then total $300 a week or more. But they call this funeral insurance. Many young workers are leaving the area because they don't feel the furnaces will ever roar again. But the leaders of the steel union locals haven't given up. With a federal loan, they say they could profitably begin pouring steel again. Religious leaders started the campaign for community worker ownership in 1977 when another huge mill closed. The church effort got Washington to consider the plan and a federally supported feasibility study said it made sense. Then Washington gave up on the idea, saying it was too expensive. But a beginning had been made on getting federal support for the community worker ownership concept. What do you think about this plan for the trying to get the community and the unions to buy this mill, the Ohio mill. I don't think it's ever going to happen. There's not enough money there. Well, and I think, uh, uh, what do you think? I think it's, it's a good plan it's, uh, if it works out, because there's other plans in the uh, United States, I know, up in the East there, that, that uh, the workers that bought the plant, and, they, and they've done real good. Some of these smaller plants, too, that they've bought. It, it can work out, but I don't think the rich man's going to allow it. The rich corporation's not going to allow this, because it's going to hurt them. It's, it's happened yes that Aeroquip, the rubber company, where the employees purchase yeah, part of the yeah. plant, they're operating successfully, you know. You're talking just of a little plant employing uh, possibly 100, 200 men. Whereas the uh, U.S. still, hey, uh, I, I can't see where the union or the employees can purchase the, the plant. But I wish it would happen. And, the, and the, I wish the government would back them up. Because that's the only thing it's going to do. Because the human being, you work in the mill, you're part of the mill. 
I mean, why should you be an outcast? You should have the voice of it. I mean, even as far as going to share the profits of, of, the, of the steel mill, it should be there. In the past 18 months, Washington seems to have become more sympathetic to public ownership as an alternative to devastating shutdowns, but it has not supported any purchase on the scale of the Ohio mill. Just a few hundred yards from the works is the headquarters of the steel local that is leading the takeover campaign. Unlike the previous ecumenical coalition effort, this drive is led by labor. This day-long conference to fight plant closings was held by the union earlier in the month. Steel, auto, rubber, and electrical workers from Ohio and neighboring states came. There were workshops on pushing for laws to stop sudden plant closings, on getting maximum benefits and services for the unemployed, and on the Youngstown buyout strategy. Steel workers also shared facts about the industry. U.S. Steel has chosen not to keep up its steel production. They've bought steel from Japan. They've invested money in Japanese steel. Our pension funds have been invested in that. Um, and I think that they've just... The rate of profit has been greater elsewhere, so that's where they've gone. And they don't care about the workers. They don't care about making steel. U.S. Steel has shut some 14 plants in the country, blaming the recession, foreign imports, and poor profits. Critics say the industry's plight is at least partially self-induced. It never reinvested in new technology and now may license it from Japan. I have 22 people left in my local country. It was described, oh, six, nine months ago, and many of you have seen this in Business Week. They call it Big Steel's liquidation. And they talk about the fact that from the point of view of the money managers at, at U.S. Steel, they'd rather be in petrochemicals. They'd rather be in fertilizers. They might rather be in banking. Because steel may be profitable, but it isn't profitable enough. And so what they do, in fact, in business schools, they teach the new managers how to acquire what they call, literally, this is the term they use in business school, how do they acquire cash cows, milk them dry, and then move on. Their argument is what's good for them is good for us. It's not a new argument. Their argument is... Let's pass this super accelerated depreciation bill, the jones conable bill, the so-called 1053 bill, because that will put more money for investment in the hands of the steel companies. And of course, what they're saying is if they've got more money to invest, they'll invest it and steel workers will have jobs. But what they teach at the business schools and what they talk about in the corporate boardroom is not how to get more money or capital to invest in steel, it's how to get more capital to invest in what they think is most profitable to them. The argument for giving them the subsidy is that if you do it, they will create jobs for us. The truth is that in almost every instance, the monies they have gotten through subsidies have not created new jobs for us. They have increased the ability of those corporations to acquire other corporations, increased their power, increased their ability to milk those cash cows, milk them dry, move on, and don't look back. Now, I remember in the old Depression in the 1930s, I'm an old buck and I remember those days, we organized what they called Workers' Alliance and Unemployment Compensation, uh, uh, unemployment councils all over the United States. And millions of people were mobilized to fight for things, and that's when we got unemployment compensation finally, and we got welfare for the first time in history. And that's when they gave Social Security for the first time in history, because the people were mobilized. Now, our job is to mobilize the people. I think one of the things that we wanted to see here, and, and, and something that, that we got to start talking about, is that you know, in every one of these situations, our committee, we've got to save our jobs committee in the local, and it's been going for about three months. We got petition drive going, we got some legislation pr proposed, we got congressmen that are going to help us put it together. But to take these, you know, it's a national conspiracy against us. I think a lot of people have said that. These companies all get together. You know, they all talk to each other. How can we, how can we, just, how can we uh, shut down our plants in Ohio and get away with it? Well, we'll do this, this, and this, you know? we got to have a national movement against the shutdowns. The biggest problem we run up against, and the reason we from Homestead came to this thing, is, is, is the question that was raised by the first speaker over there, the Great Panther senior citizen, 
How do you mobilize people? How do you get people active? Why aren't the masses or the majority of the rank and file active? The reason a lot of them aren't active is not because they aren't angry about the situation. It's because they don't think we can win. They don't think you can do anything about it. They think the enemy, big business, is too big, too colossal. There's no way we can take them on. The majority of the unemployed people at our local are fighting for their life. I got four kids and I went to get food stamps and they told me my $170 unemployment insurance was too much. I can't get food stamps. So I gotta try to support a family on $170 a week. I got needs, this woman here has got needs. We got needs right now that have to be met. The unemployed are fighting for those needs. When we get out there and we organize, we for, I formed an unemployed committee and we're organizing the unemployed at our local to keep them in touch with the local, keep our local strong, and organize them around their own needs. When people see that they can fight and win, or at least put up a hell of a fight, then they begin to raise their heads up. Then they begin to say, maybe we can take on this big colossal enemy. Maybe we can take on big business and win. Labor Day is going to be the day that we go to Washington with all the workers. I think we've got to put our problem out front. And that's not for the legislators. That's for America. That's for the whole country. I love it. Here. At the noon break, Pullman Company workers from Chicago talked about federal help and then listened to the leader of the Youngstown Drive. You know, our problem is that Pullman announced that they was going out of the passenger car business a while back, and they're the last American-owned passenger corporation in, in the United States. The well, only other one left is uh, Bud, and they're German-owned by Tyson Steel. Uh, and it's a shame that, that a company that, that's, that's built a multi-million dollar corporation on passenger cars now say they're not profitable enough. What they're doing is they're taking their money and they're putting it in petrochemical because there's more money to be made there. You know, but the country's needs is, pe is, is mass transit. But they just, they, they don't worry about the country's needs, they're worried about making money. The, the thing about Pullman, which is amazing, as, as John said about the profits, is it's not like there aren't orders out there. With many companies that shut down, there's no orders for the cars, there is conservatively estimating at least a billion dollars worth of orders waiting to be taken. And the problem in America today is there are not the facilities for building mass transit rail cars in this country. And we have the solution to that. We think the federal government should. If it ha if Foreman won't build them, the federal government should build them and take responsibility for that. Uh, it's, it, it comes down to a matter of, I think, uh, uh, social needs versus private profit. And look, all these other countries, you know, they, they build mass transit and the government subsidize them. Japan, they got one of the best, uh, they got these cars that, that'll, that'll run at, at, at uh, over 100 plus miles an hour. You know, if we had that kind of rail system, you could get between cities in this country into the heart of the city faster than you could fly it. For us to come here, it took us longer to get to O'Hare than it took to get to Youngstown. <laughs> trying to get out there but the train stations are in the middle of town and people can can zip right in there but the tra the tracks are so bad the cars we're building they're designed for 110 and those cars unless some tracks are built those cars will never go over 50 55 tops how you doing you, you met bob sure yes, how you doing good to see you your name is great great to meet you we was just uh kind of talking here bob and you know we know You've got a situation here in Youngstown, and if you could just kind of, you know, tell us what you guys have done, and maybe you can help us with, with our problems if, if you now and find Well, your basically what we find ourselves up against is what uh, everybody here is uh, all about, you know, plant closing. You know, and uh, what we did was try to explore alternatives to plant closing. We did the, uh, what we felt was in the, uh, within our control, you know, to take the management. We went down and uh, tried to meet with them, uh, talked about the uh, possible concessions that uh, employees could make in the uh, crew sizes, manning practices, incentives, uh, the whole bit. But uh, we were informed that the decision was made at the board of directors level and it wasn't a local issue that they couldn't talk about it. 
The only way of uh, revoking that decision would be through the action of the board of directors. And so it appeared as if we had no alternative. So when you get your back up against the wall, you know, you start exploring, what can you do? So then we came up with the idea of uh, community worker ownership. And uh, basically uh, we knew that uh, we've been making steel here all our lives. Guys in the plant, uh, 40, 45 years of service, 35 years of service, it was no mystery. If there's anything we knew how to do, that was make steel. And then, uh, you know, they talk about uh, what's profitable, what isn't profitable. Through uh, litigation, we were able to find out that these works were profitable. This is not a grocery store in a corner or a gas station shutting down. This is a, a steel mill that the whole community was formed around. But you get back the housing? to, to yeah. the question, Marvin, you talked about yeah. how do you put it together. Yeah. And right. it boils down to nobody's going to do it for you. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it yourself. What you do is uh, you talk to people, you find out uh, the business of uh, what lawyers do when they incorporate. You get that uh, those mechanics in place. You, you find out uh, the manner in which business operates. They do uh, marketing studies, uh, feasibility studies on the product, and you put it all together. There's people out there uh, who have just as much concern as you do, you know. That's what uh, basically this conference is about, too, trying to get all these people together so we can help each other. So what, it, what it actually boils down to, and what I've always said, <coughs> they may own the company, but we own the jobs, and what it boils down to is we may have to own them both. That's right. So far, U.S. Steel has rejected the idea of selling to Community Steel, Inc. They want to bulldoze the works and sell it off as scrap. But the steel locals want an injunction stopping this. And now, with $50,000 from Washington, they're doing a preliminary feasibility study on their plan to sell specialty steel the mill makes to customers they've already lined up. Stoughton Lynn, historian and anti-Vietnam War activist, now a labor lawyer, is counsel for community steel. He doesn't see an easy path. What do you do if the company doesn't want to let you have the property? And. Uh, some of us here think that we may find ourselves in that situation with United States Steel. That is to say, we may, this second time around, get a willingness on the part of the federal government to make available the grants and loan guarantees, but have the problem that U.S. Steel doesn't want to sell to us. If we get in that situation, we're thinking about eminent domain or some variant thereof under the state or federal urban renewal statutes. That is, we're thinking about the idea that a community can say to a private company, hey, we've been here all these years. We've worked with you. We've uh, made it possible for you to run your privately owned railroad from one steel mill to another steel mill seven miles away. We've supported you when you lobbied to get uh, breaks from the federal EPA. Uh, you and we have had a family kind of relationship, and now you've uh, unilaterally determined to break that off. We're not going to try to stop you going, but we are telling you that if you can't use this property, we're going to use it. I think right here in Youngstown, uh, being the first to attempt it, one of the first things you have to do is educate people on what is worker community ownership. I know when the coalition started up, which uh, the local unions, uh, a lot of the union uh, officers uh, played a, a minor role and participated in it. Um, we didn't get across to our people what is a worker community ownership. I don't think we're having that problem in Youngstown today. But there was also red baiting, that this is something new, that, uh, that this is communist, and you had to f combat that a little bit. Uh, you have people right here and today fighting over the large amounts of federal grants that are in the area. You have the business identity out there fighting for that money, and you have the workers trying to get a hold of that money. If if there were Community Steel Incorporated in Youngstown, and if we sensed the need for mass transit that was being talked about in our workshop this morning, we might have to become 
lobbyists for mass transit in order to create part of the market that we needed to keep our own <coughs> business alive. I don't think we could stop at a little island of worker and community owned enterprise. I think we'd find that we had to, to, uh, to broaden our movement even in order to survive economically. In the structure of community steel, there are to be 11 directors. Five of those directors are to be elected by the workers. The reason it's a minority is that you're also going to need capital from outside the enterprise, from ordinary common stockholders. And I guess the thought was not to frighten them too much by having a worker majority. But we have a secret weapon, which is that the Articles of Incorporation also provide that all basic decisions in the corporation layoffs of more than 10% of the people, uh, mergers, relocations, the, the kind of decision that's destroyed us here in the valley in the last three years. Any basic decision of that kind would require the approval of the worker directors. So that if the workers had their shit together, they would in all likelihood be able to control at least the basic decisions in the corporation. The idea of worker directors is a relatively new one in the United States, and when Douglas Frazier, head of the auto workers, was elected to the Chrysler board, it was a first. However, the notion of giving the individual employee influence over basic corporate decisions beyond wages and working conditions seems to appeal to members of Congress. They wrote the Chrysler bailout so that the workers would eventually own 15 to 20 percent of the stock and be able to elect other company directors. What the men and women of Youngstown Community Steel want to do is an even more dramatic departure. They want basic policy control. Bob Vasquez was pleased with the response they got at the conference. Well, it uh, kind of overwhelms me, you know. Uh, uh, we knew that uh, the sentiment was out there, what we were talking about, and uh, the economic uh, dislocation that people are suffering throughout the country. It uh, seems to me as if there's finally uh, a group coming together, a coalition of, uh, you've seen it, um, minority groups, uh, steel workers, rubble workers, auto workers, coal miners, uh, with a common cause. Uh, we're able to project that cause and continue it on. And uh, I, see you'll, I think you'll see something that, uh, beyond belief, taking place. And that's, uh, finally, we'll start getting our piece of the pie. There's a better way than shutting plants down and just okay. walking away. We can do it ourselves. Whether the men who make steel in the Mahoning Valley will get the mill open again is phlegmatic. Their court case is considered a long shot. And although President Carter is set to sign a bill next week that for the first time formally supports worker ownership, the most it will provide is half a million dollars per project. And the steel workers figure a fair price for the Ohio works would be about $50 million. So Washington isn't likely to come rushing forward. There does seem to be an enormous hunger in our land for discussion and debate on alternative economic strategies. In a sense, Business Week acknowledges the crisis and its current issue, calling for the reindustrialization of America. The magazine urges the forging of a new social contract, but warns that this must take precedence over the aspirations of the poor, the minorities, and the environmentalists. Although this would, in fact, write off a sizable part of our nation, Business Week doesn't shy away from asking the government to spend public monies primarily to underwrite the expansion and strengthening of the private sector. Well, given the federal and state help already afforded the private sector, a lot of people will ask how Business Week thinks the economy will do any better next time around if the name of the game is more of the same. Nowhere in their prescription does Business Week suggest that genuine involvement of employees, worker participation, Economic democracy, or whatever you call the broadening of the decision-making process, might contribute to a healthier industrial climate. In Washington, however, both conservatives and liberals seem to feel that participatory capitalism is on the agenda for the 80s. Conservatives support the local initiative and self-reliance inherent in the idea, and liberals applaud democratizing the workplace. One thing seems certain to me. It's an admission of moral and economic failure to allow 10 million people periodically to be put out of work as part of our economic process. Yes, we do need a new social contract, as Business Week suggests. 
but if there are community and worker groups who can help write it and participate in it, they should contribute. I'm Bill Moyers. For a transcript of this program, send $2 to Bill Moyers Journal, Box 900, New York, New York, 10101. Please include the program title with your request. Funding for this program has been provided by this station and other public television stations, and by grants from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Ford Foundation, and the Weyerhaeuser Company.